Okay, boom. Uh, so we started recording, just so everyone is aware, uh, this meeting is being recorded uh, for, for purposes of being redistributed and uh, redistributed and displayed on the, uh, the County Health Department website. Uh, the first thing on the agenda is that coming up next week, we'll be doing a Tuesday and Thursday on exceptional education classroom mitigation. So if that's something that uh, you, applies to your school or to the population that you work with, uh, we've been working with um, a, a local coalition that's uh, heavily involved and has a lot of subject matter experts. A lot of those were pulled from these particular meetings on our Tuesday and Thursday, uh, and they've got some really great um, uh, uh, information on, on uh, what kind of mitigation can take place in those classrooms and things that are more successful. So be ready for that next week. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go over some of these internet website uh, resources before we jump over to the emergency measure. So it gives uh, Dexter just a little bit more time to, to prep. <clears throat> so the first thing is the uh, state schools dashboard. We're going to jump to that. You'll see this information probably uh, update on Thursday of this week on Thanksgiving. Uh, and yes, absolutely, Sherry, you can totally invite anyone you want to to next week's meeting. So uh, uh, absolutely, we want we want that content to to uh, to be helpful for folks. And um, if that means you want to get the, the folks that it's most pertinent to on the phone for that, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so we're uh, currently in Pima County. We are at uh, 203 per 100K cases per individual, we're at 8.3% positivity. Our hospitalizations for COVID-like illness is hovering underneath uh, uh, 4%. Um, we're expecting on Thursday this to go into red uh, for percent positivity. So just know that's uh, that's expected. Um, and uh, we're, we're trying to figure out what that's gonna mean for our schools right now. Um, <clears throat> if we jump over to the Pima County metrics, uh, which we're going to jump back to this website in just a little bit here, just so everyone knows where to find this. We're on the Pima County COVID-19 data reports on our COVID-19 progress report, which is, again, updated in thir every Thursday to match up with the, uh, uh, the ADHS um, display. Uh, here you'll see where we're at this uh, two consecutive weeks uh, of uh, incline and our percent positivity, again, that's probably gonna jump into red on Thursday. Um, you may not see that actual update happen in real time on Thursday because it is Thanksgiving and folks over here have been uh, 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 pretty packed. So you'll uh, Friday is when you may see this actually jump over to, to the criteria not met. But again, that's kind of what we're expecting to see. Underneath that, under healthcare system, Right now, our adequate hospital bed capacity for two times the current COVID cases surge statewide. That criteria is not met. I do want to talk briefly about that. <clears throat> um, so in terms of, of uh, the, uh, the um, ICU beds and how they're filled, when we look back at June and July, when we had similar numbers to what we are at now, and we are now in excess of where we were then, our, our, our hospital ICU beds were just were were uh, um, there's a higher number of those beds that were filled with COVID patients. Currently, where we're at, uh, it's significantly lower. The ICU beds are are uh, um, being occupied by folks primarily who are not uh, displaying COVID-like symptoms or because of COVID um, situations. So it's an interesting trend. We're examining that in more detail, and we'll have more data for everyone. Uh, more information for everyone on what that what that actually means and what that translates to. Um, we do know that that's going to be informative for us in terms of of uh, prevention um, uh, somewhere uh, uh, prevention in other areas that we should be uh, we should be looking at. So uh, um, just know that that's upcoming. Public health tracking prevention. Remember, we talked about this uh, timely case investigation. Uh, before, and, and we're probably going to just continue to see this in the red. Our schools overall have been doing a really good job with this, but I, I want to take a moment just to, to talk about this because it's kind of important. We've had such a high volume of cases over the last two to three weeks um, that uh, just on, on Sunday, for example, we had over 900 cases 
uh, and that's that's across the county. That's not just with our schools. So the ability for our contact tracers and case investigators to actually catch up with the amount of work in terms of the close contacts has been really limited in its capacity. So we're we are we are trying to get to all of them. Um, I just don't think it's possible for us to touch base with all of those close contacts. So if you're if you as a school have that opportunity to connect with close contacts within your community, whether those are uh, especially the parents of students, um, we're, we need to refocus our message a little bit in terms of uh, the sense that uh, the contact tracers are going to try to get to you, but they may not just because of the volume right now. If you're a case, on the other hand, that is that's a, a higher priority. The cases are people that we are trying to connect with within a timely manner, but we're seeing a lag of up to four to five days before those cases are hearing from our case investigators right now. I remember a case is a positive, uh, a COVID positive person who has a confirmed positive test. So <clears throat> again, because of the volume, it's it's really difficult for us to, to get to all of these cases in close contacts right now. So we just ask that you be patient. Um, that you continue with the, the excellent mitigation in the schools. I do want to just highlight that again. We're not seeing rates of transmission in our schools, or we're not seeing transmission happen within our schools. The, the disease as it's spreading is not happening in classrooms. There are exceptions to that, and that's when mitigation isn't being followed appropriately. So close contact is an issue. Masks are not being worn. Uh, surfaces are not frequently being uh, washed. Staff lunches is one that's come up. Uh, you know, we've had uh, we've had uh, um, some faculty that <clears throat> you know decided to have a lunch together, and during that lunch, no one's wearing a mask. Everyone was under six feet, and there was an outbreak as a uh, as a result of that. Um, athletics again continues to be an issue. Uh, we have been very firm in our stance that right now, especially right now in this spike that we're seeing, is not the time to be playing any kind of contact sport. Uh, football should not be, be uh, uh, being played right now. AIA has supported that stance and their recent uh, declaration of that they, they uh, do think that we are in significant transmission and they have recommendations underneath scenario three, which is on their website. We reviewed that pre previously that, that very clearly states that there should be no competitive games going on. Um, the county has backed that up with a proclamation that was issued this last week that closed down all of our athletic centers at the, at the Kino sports complex. There was a memo that came from uh, the director on that. So we are, we are, uh, uh, trying to to walk the walk the talk over here on our part, and we we are just asking you all, so schools, to 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 stop doing the athletics. Uh, practices are fine um, as long as the, you can work on cardio, you can do muscular strength, flexibility. There's tons of things that you can do, and solo drills are totally appropriate. But competitive uh, interactions are not appropriate at this point in time because of these these spike in cases. Which right here, I I, I mean that's. That's all we need to look at to show that there is significant transmission in the county right now. Okay, <clears throat> let's jump back over to the agenda briefly. Just another reminder: close contacts are, <clears throat> excuse me, are cumulative over a 24-hour period. So that's less than six feet for 15 minutes or more over a period of 24 hours, exempting, of course, when you're in close physical contact. And again, I'll give football as an example. If you're a defensive lineman and you're up in someone else's grill, that's an immediate close contact. There's no 15-minute rule for that. It's an immediate. <clears throat> Our outbreaks in schools, currently we're sitting at 18 total. Um, as of uh, yesterday, we logged uh, uh, another few. So we're 18 total outbreaks that we're aware of at this point. An outbreak is defined as two or more epidemiologically linked cases within a school setting. Um, so again, because of that, we're we're still uh, we're still adamant that our schools are doing a very good job at their mitigation. Because if they weren't, then we'd see a heck of a lot more outbreaks in schools. <clears throat> uh, this link for isolation space guidance was just updated, and I do want to, uh, and I will I will talk about that here in a moment, Megan. The, uh, what you're posting in the chat. So previously, we've uh, we've tried to get out this uh, National Association of School Nurses isolation uh, situation going on. Uh, so um, 
as you glance through this, there's there are a ton of really, really great resources on this website. And this has hyperlinked into the agenda that will be sent out to you all uh, post this meeting today. The uh, piece that right here, considerations for school nurses regarding care sure. students and staff. No, no, no. Sorry, uh, no, no. whoever just joined us, if you wouldn't mind muting, okay. that'd be really helpful. Thank you. Uh, considerations for school nurses regarding care of students and staff that become ill or arrive uh, at school, uh, ill at school or arrive sick. This is where you'll find that document, okay, right here. For whatever reason, the link to this that I keep sending out doesn't work, but it works fine when you go through the actual website. So this gives you a ton of really great uh, increased um, uh, ideas around the, uh, the isolation room guidance as well as some other things. So again, this is updated. In the, uh, in the agenda. <clears throat> this is where it'll take you to, and there's tons of other really great resources, which we will be highlighting in future sessions. So to go to the chat and just address some of the things popping up here before we pass it off to Dexter, the memo, the memo that came out yesterday uh, was essentially um, a, uh, a memo from the administrator, Chuck Huckleberry, which is asking for uh, high school athletics to cease and desist all, uh, all activities. There is a uh, um, there is a piece on that that it um, uh, I I I will have to look at that in more detail in regards to practice uh, before I actually speak to that Megan. So I think while Dexter's doing his thing, I'll go back re-examine that memo, maybe talk to my director really quick and see uh, what the thoughts are on or in regards to your question on the ceasing practices, because the conversations that we've been having internally so far have been that. Um, practice, as long as it's solo drills, is totally appropriate and is actually something that we think should be, in some sense, encouraged uh, just because of um, social and emotional wellness factors that are, are continue to be a driving focus for us as a health department and a consideration as we continue to work with our schools. Question from Ms. Walker. Good morning for a close contact. How many days back from the positive test should we track to determine who would be considered a close contact? It's 48 hours, Ms. Walker. And that is from either start of symptoms or from a positive test if they're asymptomatic. So let's say student starts displaying symptoms on Wednesday, you would track 48 hours backwards from start of symptoms. So if they started symptoms at noon on Wednesday, then it would be all the way back to Monday at noon is where you would define that close contact. If they took a test because they were asymptomatic uh, on that on that Wednesday at three o'clock, no symptoms, but they went and took a test because they were uh, had a possible exposure and that test came out positive, then it would be all the way back to Monday at three o'clock because they took the test at Wednesday at three o'clock. So it's a 48 hour window, okay? not days. Uh, thank you, Penny, for dropping the link in there. Uh, great question, Ms. Huff. I will address that here in a, a moment. Oh, Dexter got it. Boom. Uh, the exception of the close contact definition you said as you use the football players as an example. Absolutely, Sherry. So uh, just make sure no one else got that. Okay, so there are technically five requirements for close contact. One is 15 minutes or uh, more for under six feet. Um, for a, uh, a cumulative 24 hour period. There's also uh, physical contact, which is like hugging or kissing, right? So that's one of the things that defines close contact. That's an automatic close contact. Uh, another one would be sharing eating or drinking utensils. There's caring for someone who is a positive COVID patient automatically puts you into a close contact scenario. And uh, the last one is um, Caretaking, sharing of eating, drinking, hugging, kissing, oh, being sneezed or coughed upon by someone who is a COVID positive case automatically puts you into a close contact uh, situation. And that's all on that uh, visual graphic that we developed internally. And I'll, I'll, uh, I'll bring that up on a share screen here in a moment. Okay, thanks, Penny, for dropping that uh, NASA and document anywhere. <clears throat> AIA stance in conjunction with PCHD and stopping competition for sports is straight across the board for middle and high schools. Uh, yes, it is. They uh, they are very clear on where, um, in fact, let's just go to it really quick. Dexter, are you on by any chance? I'm here. I'm here. Awesome. <clears throat> so I'm going to pull this up really quick and then I'm just going to pass the mic to you. Uh, to answer your question, Jesuita, Jesuita, uh, 
right here, <clears throat> phase return to sports scenario three. This is the scenario which is based off of substantial community spread. You can find this on the AIA's website. At the very bottom of this, it's very clear. They say no competitions meets tournaments shall occur. So they've been really clear on that. Um, uh, I, I think there's still some kind of like state football thing going on for some reason on that. I'm not sure why that is, but uh, they're, they're very clear on this piece here. Okay, so I hope that answers your question. Dexter, I'm gonna pull up the executive uh, emergency measure here. And then um, if there's anything you wanna screen share, go for it. In the meantime, I'll just uh, look through that memo and see if I can get that question answered for Ms. Walker. Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll screen share my, my stuff over here just so everyone can follow along or I can scroll. All righty. So I know it's an exciting week. Everyone loves when new policy comes out, or maybe it's just me, uh, but excited to kind of show some of this stuff. We got a, a little bit of a wrinkle that uh, the ADHS ha has granted us authority to do some stuff. But just so you all know uh, where to find it on our uh, COVID page here for uh, the ADHS website. If you come down here on the little sidebar to administrative orders, waivers, deferments, yada, yada, yada. And we let it load. Uh, when we scroll down here a little bit, emergency measures and 2020-04 is our our measure here. Uh, I know that Penny dropped the link in there, but in case you all need to find it at any other point, that's where you'll find it on the ADHS website. It's just kind of uh, bogged down. Uh, the important thing to know when reading any kind of executive order or emergency measure is that all the boring stuff starts with whereas. Uh, you can scroll right past that because that's not anything new. That is just uh, where they're deriving authority from or describing the situation. So I always skip right down to the now therefore I because that's the the meat of the measure. And so 2020-04 uh, doesn't change a ton for us. Uh, it is now being more firm and saying here in point one that the school districts must mandate that masks are worn in schools. You know that's stuff that we've been recommending for a long time and now it's maybe a little bit firmer language. Um, they do note a couple exceptions for when students and staff would not need to wear masks. Um, one of them are, you know, high, high intensity activities like running shall not be required to wear a mask if it causes difficulty breathing. Um, they give a, a loophole there. Again, children under two here under point C do not need to uh, wear a mask, as well as folks who are unconscious, incapacitated, etc. Uh, da, 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 da. Schools have to abide by these. That's part D, um, and it talks about socially distancing and uh, mask wearing. So that's the the main meat of the rules part of it. Just saying this is now a requirement within school facilities. Part two of this under bullet point two now gives uh, health departments authority to enforce it. So before we, we were simply recommending. And now the, the state government has given us an avenue to enforce these policies. So if, if folks are, are you know, not wearing a mask in schools, um, that, that is a problem and it gives us kind of an avenue to uh, do something about it. Whereas before it was just kind of, we didn't have a whole lot of options on our end. Um, and, and so that's between the health department and uh, law enforcement, police, regulatory agencies that might uh, be involved with schools, uh, they kind of have the opportunity to find what they want to do about enforcement. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what we've decided on for that yet, but uh, it, it's a, a card in the deck at this point. Um, point three, notwithstanding another law, uh, if the Arizona Department of Health Services becomes aware of continued actions taken by entities covered in this emergency measure, namely schools, uh, that jeopardize health, safety, and welfare of the public, the ADHS will take additional action as necessary to protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, uh, which is just saying that if these problems continue to, to be an issue with a certain school, that the ADHS uh, has the ability to escalate any enforcement. Um, again, I don't exactly know what that looks like, but uh, it seems like Dr. Christ uh, and the state level uh, of the government are, are taking this seriously now. and. Um, so that's kind of worded there. Uh, the last two points of this are fairly unexciting. Um, 
five just gives a term limit on this particular order. It's not going to last longer than 18 months. And four just says that if anything within the order comes out as being uh, unconstitutional, that it's severable. So these aren't aren't particularly exciting. Um, but that's that's what I got so far. I'm going to stop screen sharing. And if folks would like to ask any questions, feel free. I know I just gave a lot of information there, um, but this is kind of weird stuff that excites me. I know, right? <laughs> Thank you, Dexter. That's awesome. I will take it as I did it totally perfectly, and it's crystal clear to everyone. And that's great. Dude, you always do. <laughs> like policy king, policy prince, the prince of policy. That's what we're gonna call you. Uh, all right. So, um, yeah. Seeing if you if you do get questions and immediately go ahead and uh, and drop them into the chat, or just feel free to unmute and ask Dexter directly. Uh, he is the Prince of Policy. Can you post the link of the ADHS site? Uh, yes. So that actually, uh, Min, is in the agenda that will be sent out to you all post this conference. But um, maybe, Dexter, uh, if you want to just copy and paste that into the chat right now, too. Okay. Um, so uh, I am waiting to hear back from either uh, my director or from the um, assistant county administrator uh, in regards to the previous question. Um, however, I do have a copy of that memo up, so I'm just going to do a screen share on this and we'll do a very loose interpretation. Um, please note that this is not the, the final interpretation that we'll be offering for that. Um, but right here, it does say specifically, cease all fall athletic events at public schools, including football practice and games. So it's, it does specifically mention practice for football. Um, uh, so there's, there's, a uh, uh, that's the, that's the main event. Um, as soon as I get uh, a uh, feedback from, hopefully I get something back before 9.30 today. Um, although, please understand that we are, again, pretty slammed right now. So it's, uh, it's challenging. Um, so uh, we'll, uh, while I have this up on the screen, I'm just going to jump back over to the chat box and try to get some questions uh, addressed there. After school programs available for parents and students, are there separate guidelines from during the regular school day? So uh, state law definitely supersedes our local law. And I know according to the uh, Governor Ducey's Open for Learning that passed back in August or uh, June, whenever that was, um, there is uh, there are clauses in there about schools um, still needing to fulfill the role of a safe place for students to go to. Um, and I don't know how applicable that is to after school programming. I think in some cases it would be just because you have parents that work at times till seven o'clock at night and those, those parents need childcare and schools provide that resource for them. So if it's an after school care program, I think it would be exempt underneath the law, but that's something, Dexter, if we can maybe just dig a little bit deeper into that and have an answer before next week, that'd be great. Um, a question from Johanna, does the mandate for masks also pertain to preschool students above the age of two? Absolutely not. Uh, and, and in fact, in the city of Tucson, the mask mandate only applies to five and older. So uh, um, it'd be, I, I think, uh, that's the city, though. Uh, Dexter, what's your interpretation on on how this emergency measure applies to you? Uh, to would this would I guess technically supersede the city's law, right? Yeah. So this would preempt that. Um, it's a real question of definition. You know, the the technicality of it. Do we define the is a preschool as a preschool? OK, then the, I would interpret that as a school that would require mask above age of two. Uh, if it is uh, a child care facility, 
there might be some wiggle room in that. Uh, and then it would just be the, the five and up from the county. Um, so uh, that, that's something to look into. That's actually a, a weird question. So I'm going to write it down and try and have an answer for you on that, Joe. I just wonder about these professionals. Let me get an answer on that. It's already out there. I'll publish all over. Mm -hmm. Julie, you will? Sorry, Julie, did you repeat that? Oh, maybe there's just a uh, unmuting issue. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, schools need to report positive cases involving parents and students who are not on campus learning. They are distance learning. Uh, great question, Min. So currently the health department staff is just for students to report those as positive cases. Um, and currently we are still wanting remote learners to be reported as positive, although that that may change within the, uh, the next uh, couple of weeks, just because we really are trying to keep track of uh, we we want we want kids in school. That's the bottom line with the health department. We feel that it's a safe place. That because of all the other uh, emerging information around social emotional wellness for kids, that you know schools schools provide uh, a, a place for uh, where students should be right now. Unfortunately, the burden of education right now is that not only are you a place for kids to go to learn, you're also a social center, you're also a counseling center. You, there's so many roles that you all have just kind of been uh, given or voluntold to take on that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a community response for a child to be uh, part of a school in, in some way, shape or form. So. Um, because of that, we want our kids in schools as a whole. And for us, what we're finding on our end is that when we are able to contact trace and case investigate students as quickly as possible, it uh, it enables that return to school to happen uh, in a, a in a a quicker way, right? Um, the whole reason why we continue to advocate for hybrid, has been because our schools have been on top of uh, reporting in these cases. Uh, we've been keeping track of the vast majority. I'd say we probably get about 80% of cases that occur within the school systems get reported to us. And that's just that's just a guess. Uh, but I know that we've got a, a lot of you on here have, have reported cases directly over to our team. We have been able to run analyses on all of those case reports. We've looked at where cases are potentially connected. And the vast, vast majority of, of where students are acquiring transmission has been from outside of a school setting. Um, again, the exception of that continues to be athletics and like uh, other school social related functions. Um, but as a whole, like we want, we want that trend to continue because we think that not only that, but I, as a side note, since that transmission is happening outside of school, it means that they're that it's, ha it's not happening in school, that means that it's less likely to continue to happen there, which means that that transmission rate overall is lower when kids are in school, right? So in a sense, it's a community prevention measure from virus spread. So uh, that's that's kind of where we're at with that. Question from uh, Kay Sullivan. Will PCHD continue to support hybrid learning if two of the three metrics are in the red zone? three of the three metrics are in the red zone. If three out of three in the disease data, and remember, Kay, we have nine uh, metrics for that county. So let me pull back over to the page so you can just kind of see that. So we have nine of these metrics, right? We're guessing that this is probably going to jump into red on, on Thursday or Friday. Um, we definitely, if all of these fall into red, we will, we will recommend remote at that point. But if we look over back at ADHS, and the COVID-like illness, which is the third of those, there's no way this is going to get to red in the next couple of weeks. The problem with that is if we continue to see these cases climb and climb and climb uh, over the next couple of weeks, then this really serves as an invalid data point in terms of our recommendation for remote learning. So we, we've had multiple discussions <laughs> internally at the health department at this point about, and this has been ongoing for the past three weeks, We've never dealt with a situation like this before. Um, I, I don't think there's uh, any state that that has dealt with a, a pandemic response in terms of providing uh, uh, 
uh, guidance to educators in terms of remote, hybrid, and the other systematic structures that exist within the system. So uh, uh, we have some thoughts about it. Um, we haven't, uh, we will, if we decide that it's time to go high, uh, remote, then we will give you a two weeks notice, uh, a two weeks heads up. And that, that for sure will happen. Um, it won't be a, hey, but tomorrow you all need to go remote. It's not going to be, it's not going to happen like that. You'll at least have two weeks to kind of plan and, and head out. A lot of districts right now are planning on going full remote until like uh, mid to late January, possibly even February, just because we're going to see, if we see what happened over the Halloween break, where we had uh, people congregating and getting together, we're going to see again, increased rates of transmission. And winter break is a time, especially with the ho these specific holidays, where people are going to congregate and get together at more frequency, which means that there's going to be higher levels of community spread. So uh, as, a, as a school uh, with a governing board, um, these conversations about, hey, if we, if we have to go to remote, how are we going to do this are really important to have right now so that uh, when you do get that two weeks notice in about two weeks, you were going to go remote from the health department, um, then you're prepared to start to handle that. Okay. Uh, so I can't I can't give you a solid answer on that point right now, um, okay? But I uh, w just know that we've we have been really uh, having intentional conversation around that, and um, we're trying to figure out the the main thing that we're trying to figure out because we don't have any other data points on which to kind of theoretically put this into action, is what's the threshold for cases per one hundred thousand to where we say okay this is where we definitely need to recommend. Is it, is it 300? Is it 250? Um, so well, when we have that information and we've been working with our EPI and with the CDC and with the state on trying to decide that, that's when we'll make the recommendation. And that's the other point that I wanna to touch on is rec remember that we're really limited by our local government in terms of what we can do. The state ultimately is the one that will make the recommendations and the state has been very clear that they're not going to make any recommendation or they're not going to make any uh, authoritative statutes in terms of remote or hybrid and that it is ultimately up to the districts and to the, the individual school sites and the governing boards to make the decisions on hybrid and remote or any other instructional models. Okay, so um, you know, uh, those, those are the constraints that we're dealing with. We can only recommend, we cannot enforce any mandatory action. We're limited by the state in terms of how we can go about doing that. So I, I, I know that's a very long-winded answer to your question, but I hope that addresses what you're asking there. Uh, post from um, Sherry, frustration is that, as you said, transmission among students. Absolutely, we continue to lose faculty and staff members. Yes, quarantine, uh, PCC is... Uh, discuss developing some communication pieces to encourage community members to strictly follow mitigation in order to keep our kids in schools. Just an idea. We did. Uh, we did a, a YouTube video. We've done some social media videos. Um, we've done press releases. I uh, will. We will continue to do um, what we can. And we are very open, very, 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 very open to any creative ideas out there among any of you who are maybe uh, former marketers or anything like that, about how we can get that message across in a better way. Unfortunately, what we're dealing with is there are still a lot of people out there who think this is a farce, who don't believe that this is a, a real thing, who have been lax around mitigation because, um, you know, I know my family, I know my friends, uh, I trust that they're safe. They get together in a room to watch a game, to, to eat together, and boom, all of a sudden you've got seven people that are infected. So uh, it's, yeah, it is incredibly frustrating, Sherry. <laughs> I share your frustration. Thankfully, we have, uh, we have a short week, so that'll, that'll help ease, alleviate some of our, our frustration as a whole, okay? Um, any other questions, comments at this point in time? At this point, I am going to cease recording of the session.